Hi everybody, welcome to Drag Racing's Golden Era. My name is Randy, I'm the Editor-in-Chief here. Uh, as always, we're so glad that you're here with us and uh, joining us for another interview series. Tonight we begin uh, part one of a three-part series with uh, Carl Olson. Carl and I talked for, I think it was almost four and a half hours during this interview. Now, <laughs> we're going to have to do a little editing down uh, to bring it into a little bit better scope time-wise. But I, I tell you, it was one of, one of the most fascinating interviews that I've ever done. As many of you know, I have uh, what could be considered a bit of a fetish with the last drag race at Lions. Uh, to me, the history of drag racing has a clear dividing point. Actually, it has several clear dividing points. But the most important one, I believe, is December 2nd, 1972, the last drag race at Lyons. It really did mark a period, uh, an end to a period of time where drag racing was more of a freewheeling, free spirit. Uh, if you got a couple of guys with a good job, let's put a top fuel dragster together and go racing on Saturday and Sunday. It was, that, it was that type of period, and it was also a highly experimental and developmental period of drag racing before that. Not that it didn't continue to evolve and, and become experimental, but the freewheeling and willing to try anything aspect of drag racing really, in my mind, began to wrap up after the last race at Lions. Um, you know, Carl and Mike Cool as a team became a team right at the leading edge of some real revolution in drag racing, which was Don Garlitz finally figuring out how to make a rear engine dragster handle and go straight down the track. And it really began to evolve the sport rapidly. But with the last race at Lions, it, and I've always thought that that race not only marked a, a change in the path of drag racing, but also it was a period of time in America where America itself as a culture began to change. And so that's why I've always put so much importance on this last drag race, because I think it's inexorably tied with the way American history went as we were drawing down in Vietnam and the seventies really started to come into uh, being at that point. So a real treat for me to be able to talk to one of my favorite drivers of all time, uh, Carl Olson. And we recorded this interview several weeks ago, and this will be part one of uh, Carl Olson's interview with us, and we really hope you enjoy it, and we're so glad that you're here tonight. So let's hit it. All right, it's my pleasure now to welcome Carl Olson to Drag Racing's Golden Era. Hi, Carl. We're really glad you're with us tonight. Hi, Randy. Glad to be here and looking forward to it. Well, uh, as with all these interviews, Carl, we always start out with the basic simple question of uh, how did you get interested in drag racing? Where did it all begin for you? I know you served in the military and uh, you were in a junior fuel dragster, but I'm assuming it goes before that even. Yeah, race car driving or race car involvement in general, all, it goes all the way back to 1947 when I was three years old. My uh, maternal aunt and uncle took me to a midget race in Carpinteria, California at a place called the Thunder Bowl. And uh, <clears throat> it was a, a night race. And uh, I can close my eyes right now and picture this little quarter mile clay oval down below us with the lights and the cars zooming around the track with uh, uh, flames shooting out of the exhaust headers and uh, throwing mud in every direction. and banging wheels. And I, I decided right then and there, I wanted to be a race car driver. And, and I was serious about it. I mean, and it carried right on through, um, you know, elementary school, junior high, high school. The first time that I ever became involved with a race car was in about 1960, I would think 59 or 60. Um, I, I was born and raised in San Pedro, California. And it, you know, being in the hub of Southern California motorsports at that time, uh, it was the ideal place for somebody with my aspirations to, to grow up. Um, and I, I worked as a deckhand on sport fishing boats when I was a teenager in junior high and high school. <clears throat> and I had to walk from my house to the landing, which was 
about a mile and a half away. <clears throat> and I had to show up at like one o'clock in the morning to, to leave at 2 a.m. on the fishing trip. And uh, I happened to be walking by a place called Modern Muffler Service in San Pedro one night at about quarter to 1 a.m. And there was a shop behind the muffler service. Then there was a light on and there, the door was open enough that I could look in from the street and see a dragster. And it was a Scotty Fan chassis research K88 with uh, a little supercharged Dodge Hemi engine. Uh, and I naturally had to walk in uh, quickly, uh, take a look. And they looked up and asked me to introduce myself. Uh, and, and it was two guys named Jack Stecker and Jesse Golden. And they were partners on this race car. Uh, and they invited me right in and I said, yeah, I'd like to hang around and chat with you, but I'm on my way to work, you know, and they said, well, come back anytime. We work on this thing pretty much every night. So, of course, I did. The next chance that I had, I showed up there and was immediately put to work polishing magnesium wheels and cleaning oil pans and, you know, doing all the grunt work that I was only too happy to do. And uh, I started going there on a regular basis. And Jack Stecker had a brother named Bill Stecker. They were partners in the muffler shop. And Bill Stecker was the partner of a guy named Jack Ewell uh, and a third partner named Jim Cambor that were at the time campaigning a, a, an injected nitro burning home built chassis dragster that just happened to win top fuel eliminator at the 1961 Bakersfield March meet. Um, with my relationship well established with the Steckers, I was invited to come out once in a while with Bill Stecker to Torrance to Jack Ewell's house where they kept their race car. And they, they invited me in to do all of the same things that I was doing uh, with the Stecker Golden and Cobb car. Uh, and I did that until I graduated from high school in 1961. During that time, the Yule, Stecker, and Cambor <clears throat> group went from their home-built injected Chrysler to putting a supercharger on the engine and running in top fuel on a regular basis. And then in about 1960, they ordered a state-of-the-art Kent Fuller chassis uh, and created a car that ultimately was referred to as Chabasco, which is a Mexican name for a big storm. Um, you know, about the time that that car was completed and they ran it the first couple of times, uh, I graduated from high school, was inducted into the U.S. Coast Guard, where I served on active duty for the next five years. I, I enlisted for four, but the government, thanks to Vietnam, decided that they needed to hang on to me for another year. So that's another story altogether. And Carl, wait, time, Carl, your, your time in the in the Coast Guard there, that was stateside? You never went overseas? Never went overseas. Okay. Uh, went through basic training in Alameda, California. Went through radio school in Broughton, Connecticut, during which time I had the ability to visit a lot of the drag strips and oval tracks on the East Coast, which was a real revelation for me. Uh, and I ended up then, uh, when I graduated from radio school at Coast Guard Radio San Francisco, which was actually in San Bruno near Champion Speed Shop and Gotelli Speed Shop, where I spent an awful lot of time, obviously. Uh, and then I was transferred to, uh, I spent a couple of years on a ship called the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Taney based in Alameda, California. During that time, I traveled on a regular basis hitchhiking, taking buses, whatever means I could to get to the Fremont and Half Moon Bay drag strips up in the Bay Area. And during one of those visits, I encountered a young Japanese American guy named Nick Muir, who had a beautiful, brand new state-of-the-art Kent Fuller dragster that he was uh, running with a uh, Dodge or P Plymouth Wedge 426 engine, supercharged nitromethane, uh, being driven by a great guy named Denny Milani, who was uh, top of the heap back in those days. He was the regular shoe for the Gote Gotelli Speed Shop special. Uh, but when they weren't running for whatever reason, he would step in and drive Nick Mira's car. I stopped by their pit area one time, uh, hung around, introduced myself, 
I could see that Nick had very little help and, and virtually none of the help that he had was really skilled or experienced. So he asked me if I could jump in and help, help him at the racetrack. And of course I was only too happy to do so. And then he invited me to come over to his shop in San Leandro uh, on weeknights when I had to leave or Liberty from, from the Taney and help him work on the car. Uh, it was he and I and a, and a guy named John Kikuchi. We were the whole crew. We were everything. Um, Nick was going through a serious learning curve with the supercharged nitro burning engine and eventually gave up on it, decided to run it unblown, naturally aspirated. Uh, and at that time, I was doing the vast majority of the mechanical work. I was doing the tune up and whatever. And that all worked out just fine. What the next step in the evolution was that I was transferred to the Coast Guard lifeboat station in Monterey, California. And that obviously took me away from San Leandro, it was well over 100 miles away from the Bay Area. And so we were starting to kind of lose track. And without my services, he was having a lot of problems. And in my opinion, he just lost interest in drag racing. You know, he had a lot of irons in the fire, a lot of business things going on. His parents were very wealthy. They owned a wholesale nursery in San Leandro. And Nick was kind of a spoiled rich kid that just got to do about whatever he wanted. And drag racing was one of those things for a while. And then it seemed like it was time for him to move on. We agreed that we would become partners and the trade-off was that I was going to get to drive the car half of the time. By that time, I had never driven a race car in anger. And, uh, and of course, it was my primary objective. So this seemed like a really good deal. And I would take the car back to Monterey with me during the week and work on it and then bring it back up to the Bay Area. And, and we would trade off uh, the driving chores. But, well, before we got a chance to make that happen, Nick decided on his own to take the car out to Fremont and drive it himself. And he kicked two connecting rods out of the engine and that was it, he was done. First of all, he knew I would be really upset about the fact that he did that without even consulting me. And I was absolutely sure he was ready to move on to something else. So he proposed to sell me the car complete the trailer and every spare part in his garage for $3,000. Wow. Well, for a Coast Guardsman, who by this time was married, $3,000 was completely out of the question. And so uh, I said, I just don't have that kind of money. And he said, well, how about this? Give me $100 when you can, and then $100 a month for the next 30 months, and you'll own everything, interest-free. <laughs> How can you how can you refuse an offer like that? <laughs> Handshake. Next thing you know, the next time that I drove up there, um, I loaded everything up in my little station wagon and, and hooked the trailer on the back and it was off to Monterey. And that was pretty much the beginning of my driver owner relationship with drag racing. And I went through a huge learning curve there, of course. Some people down in Monterey, a guy named Ace Brad for particular were really helpful in, in getting me on the right track as far as you know, properly building an engine and, and tuning and clutches, which were a thing that I had never really dealt with up to that point. Um, and slowly but surely, the car became relatively competitive and we'd go up to Fremont, which at that time had a wonderful program. Instead of a, a set top fuel field, top gas field, uh, super eliminator or whatever everybody at fremont made one or two qualifying passes in the afternoon and by 6 p.m the quickest eight cars would run for top eliminator the next eight would run for something they called first eliminator the next eight second eliminator and down the line the beauty of that was everybody got to race every week and, and i and i love that sometimes i would run in third eliminator, and sometimes I'd run in top eliminator against blown fuel Chrysler front engine dragsters. And I beat a few of them, uh -huh. which was a great source of pride, of course. Uh, wasn't, didn't make a lot of those guys real happy, but uh, I, I had the opportunity to run that car at the Bakersfield March meet, uh, Half Moon Bay, Fremont, 
uh, Sacramento Raceway, uh, up uh, Samoa Drag Strip near Arcata. Um, uh, Salinas had a, a little drag strip on an airport taxiway there that they ran once a month. It was a club operation. I and never was, knew there was. I never knew there was a drag strip in Salinas. Uh, it was fairly obscure. <laughs> like I say, car club run. It at one time it was the oldest operating drag strip in the NHRA system. Wow. Uh, until finally the airport did a, an expansion and closed down the operations. But uh, it was a really interesting place. And I have to say one of the most dangerous places that I ever raced. But I loved it because the, the camaraderie of the people who ran there, they were all like me, you know, struggling novices, just going out to have a good time and, and, and maybe win a trophy if you're really good, really lucky on that particular day. So, Carl, the, uh, the car you're in, is that technically a junior fuel car then at this point? Technically, it wasn't. Technically, it was what the NHRA classified as an A-fuel drag strip, okay. which was a normally aspirated fuel-burning dragster, no supercharger. Uh, and the distinction was that junior fuel, particularly that they ran at Lions Drag Strip and some other Southern California tracks, were limited to 310 cubic inch displacement. Okay obviously small block Chevrolets being 90% of, of any given field uh, at Lyons. Uh, up in Northern California, there was no junior fuel, fuel category. It was a fuel dragster. If you were running class, which few of us did, we just ran whatever. Uh, and the reason that I didn't qualify for junior fuel is this thing was 430 cubic inches. Uh, and consequently there was no way in the world. So when I was, honorably discharged from the Coast Guard in 1966 and moved back to Southern California, I really didn't have a place to run the car. I did take it to Irwindale and San Fernando where they ran some combo eliminators and things like that. And uh, couldn't really be competitive because I didn't have that many people to run against. And so uh, I just had a conversation with my old friend, Jack Stecker from Modern Muffler Service. And he and his partner, Jesse Golden, had, had built a, a really controversial top fuel car with needle bearings and all kinds of crazy stuff. It was never competitive. And so they had shelved it. He wasn't really doing anything at the time, but I remembered that he had that little Dodge engine. And my memory said, I think it's only 305 cubic inches. And even though it was built supercharged, uh, I knew that it could be converted to normally aspirated by changing some pistons and a camshaft. And I proposed that to Jack Stecker and he and, and his partner, Jesse Golden jumped at it. We took my 426 wedge out, put his 305 Dodge Hemi in and ran junior fuel. Uh, we, I wish we could say that we were really competitive, but we weren't. Uh, it, it was a struggling combination, and I did a lot of things to try and light the car up. I took the Arnie Roberts aluminum shoot pack body off and had a magnesium shorty body built for it. And, you know, regardless of what I did, the thing just never made enough torque and power to, to be competitive. We would qualify, but we'd typically be a first round loser and on our way home. So at that time, I was also going out and helping Jack Ewell and Bill Stecker with their top fuel car. I was seriously back into that. By that time, they had moved from the Kent Fuller Chabasco car to a Woody Gilmore race car engineering 392 blown fuel Chrysler combination. And it was very competitive. Jack was the driver. Um, Jim Cambor from the prior team had moved on and a guy named Tom Bell had joined as a partner. And Tom was a really nice guy that I got along with well. So I would split my time between working on the junior fuel car in San Pedro and the top fuel car over in Torrance. And I would go to the races to either run the junior fuel car or to race with the top fuel car. And I got to be close friends with all of those guys. And one day, Jack, you and I were, of all things, racing mini bikes in a church parking lot <laughs> up the street from his shop. And in making a corner, he fell and broke his leg. And he was out of commission as a driver. It just happened to be his left leg, which is the clutch leg. And back in those days, there was a lot of clutch pressure on the pedal. And he, you know, there's no way he could do it. 
So they put a guy named John Martin in the car for one weekend at Lyons. John Martin was a, a, an interesting guy, very mild mannered, milk toast kind of guy, hardly ever had anything to say. But boy, he put the helmet on and slipped in the cockpit and he was an animal. Um, unfortunately, down the line, that, that turned out to be kind of a bad, bad thing. But they ran him for one weekend and he got an opportunity to drive a different car. So he was off doing his own thing and they're scratching their heads. Who are we going to put in this car until Jack's leg heals up and he can do it again? And I was over in the corner <laughs> raising my hand, you know, me, me, me. And sure enough, uh, Bill Stecker said to Jack, why don't we put the kid in the car? What the hell? He's, you know, he's been driving that junior fuel car pretty well. Oh, yeah. Well, OK, we'll give that a try for a week or two. Well, it worked out really well. Um, the car was built for Jack and he's a giant guy. He was probably over six feet tall. So, you know, I sat down in the car the first time I couldn't see over the windshield. You know? I, I couldn't, you know, the steering wheel was right ahead of me. So we got out some cushions and whatever. And, um, you know, you've all heard the story of the phone book in the seat. Well, it wasn't a phone book, but it was a pretty thick, you know, cushion to get me up high enough to where I could actually see. Well, the good news is now I could see over the windshield, but I'm looking right at the back of a 671 supercharger. And well, welcome to top fuel. You know? Well, we ran the car. I took the, we took the car out to Lions Drag Strip on a Saturday night to make my qualifying runs. I made a launch, a half run, and then a full pass, which I'll never forget. 7.11 seconds of lap time, 217.38 miles an hour. Wow. And uh, I thought I'd just died and gone to heaven. <laughs> you know, the first half of that complete run, I didn't feel was that much different from my junior fuel car, but at about seven or 800 feet, that thing took a deep breath and it threw me back in the cockpit. And I mean, I had to hang on for dear life to, to get to the lights and get the shootout. Uh, it was one of the great experiences of my entire life. And now I had a license and we went racing. You know, the very next week we went to Irwindale, kicked the connecting rod out. I got my first official oil down. <laughs> yeah, welcome again to Top Fuel. Uh, but then we started running well. Uh, we, we won a couple of uh, races at Orange County, another one at Irwindale. Um, and we decided that uh, probably in order to be more competitive, we were going to probably need to step up to a late model Chrysler Hemi engine, which was the Keith Black and Ed Pink 426 Hemis were the deal to have at that time. And of course, Jack, you will build all of our own engines, but we didn't have any money. And uh, I just happened to be working at that time uh, as general manager of a little business in Long Beach called Transdept of California Incorporated, high performance parts manufacturer. And my boss, Willie Gardner, was a real good close personal friend with somebody at Chrysler Corporation in the high performance division. And I had just mentioned to Willie at lunch one day, you know, how we were looking at maybe trying to figure out how we could get our hands on a late model Hemi. And that, that was pretty much our total conversation about it. About three weeks later, uh, I was out in the warehouse and I got called up to the front and uh, the secretary said, there's a truck here with a package to unload for you if you'll show him where to park. And so I, I backed him into the parking area and he dropped a lift gate. He had a little forklift with him and he pulled this huge wooden crate out. What the heck? I had no idea what the heck was going on and it had my name on it. It wasn't Transdept, it was Carl Olson. So I couldn't wait to get out a claw hammer and, and pop the lid off of that thing. And I'll be darned if it wasn't a complete long block 426 Hemi engine, and it wasn't just any 426 Hemi, it was a NASCAR, which had a nodular iron crankshaft and a, and a whole bunch of really trick stuff. Wow. You know, I'm blown away. That night, I went over to the shop and told these guys what happened. And they were, well, let's get that thing over here and, and, and start making the change. Well, we managed to, to get the engine over to, to Yule's shop. And we realized right away that grafting that engine into the existing car was going to be difficult and probably not optimal. 
So we contacted Woody Gilmore and uh, as was his case during those days, offered us a really good deal. Um, you know, you sell your car, take those proceeds, you know, I'll discount a few things for you. We'll slide you in the new car. And we went, yes, yeah, sign us up on that program. So that was Carl, the- uh, Carl, Carl what, year, what year would this be at this point, this Carl? This would be 1969. Okay. I took my first ride in the four, 392 car in 68, and got my license and raced a few times. Raced the first part of 1969 in that car. And then we arranged to have the new car built. Uh, at that time, uh, one of Woody's key employees, probably his premier employee, was uh, Pat Foster. Oh, really? Uh, the Pat Foster, yeah. uh, for whom I had a, a great deal of respect and, and fortunately, a really good personal relationship. And uh, he designed and built that car from scratch to my specifications. At that time, I weighed 130 pounds soaking wet. Uh, and a good wind would blow me halfway across a parking lot. <laughs> and so to have a car that I fit in perfectly was really, really a good deal. And because I was so small, the car turned out to be pretty much the smallest car that ever came out of race car engineering. Later on, that proved to be a little problem when we tried to sell the car. But for me, it was ideal. I mean, I slid in there and I, and, you know, I just... I knew I was at home and uh, we took that car out, ran it a few times. And in 1969, one of the big races in Southern California was something called the Irwindale Grand Prix of drag racing. It was a 32 car show. There was no qualifying. It was the 32 cars that had run the quickest at Irwindale Raceway that year. And they're all pre-qualified. It's a set 32 car field. And so we went out there and, uh, we won the race. We not wow. only won the race, we set top speed at 230 miles an hour, low ET at a 696. Um, pretty much took away everything they had to offer. Uh, and once the trophy presentation was done with all the pretty girls and everything, we loaded it up and, and took it back and thought we were pretty hot stuff, you know. Yeah. Come on, world, here we come. Well, for me, that meant going other places to major events, towing up to Northern California, going over to Arizona and Nevada. That just didn't work into the Yule Bell Stecker plan. Uh, they, were, they were local guys. For them, the big out-of-town deal, cross-country race was the Bakersfield March, you know, 130 miles up the road. Um, we... We uh, sold the 392 car, had enough money to, to really be competitive here in Southern California. And we did take that car, uh, I think, over to Stardust Raceway for one event. And we certainly ran the Bakersfield At March some point, meet that year. Bill Stecker decided that he didn't want to be involved in a top fuel car anymore. And I suggested that he might consider trading my junior fuel car for the a one third interest in the top fuel car. And he thought that was a grand idea. That would give him the opportunity to race with his brother again, which he hadn't done for years. And he could walk away and concentrate on business and family, which was, were the main priorities in his life at that time. So anyway, I, I was driving the car. I'm now a one third partner. There was a weekend when Jack Ewell was in the hospital. He was very ill. Uh, and I got a call from a guy named Mike Cool. Mike had just fired his most recent driver, Dick Rossburn. Cool used to fire a lot of drivers. It was part of his deal. And he asked me if I would drive his car for one weekend, two races, 4th of July weekend in 1970, uh, Irwindale on Saturday night, Orange County Friday night. And we did relatively well i've got a long story about how that went but we won't go into that now it's uh, that that's that's a story for another day suffice to say we we survived the first night at orange county we went to irwindale the next day did really well we were runner up to gary cochran there and i noticed right off the bat that his operation was flawless the car was immaculate uh the all of the mechanicals in the car, the linkages, everything were very precise. 
in spite of the fact it was another big car and I had to use another cushion to you know, get high enough in the seat to see where I was going. It was really comfortable. Everything was worked well. He had a shop of his own, a proper shop with machinery and equipment, mills and lathes and all kinds of stuff. And more importantly, he had a crew of people that would show up on a regular basis, not only to the racetrack, but uh, to the shop on weeknights. And so consequently, the maintenance was phenomenal. With that car, after the races, the engine came out, went up on the engine stand, got completely apart, clutch, everything got looked at, massaged, maintained. That usually happened on a Monday night. And by the next Saturday, any parts that were ordered were in, the car got put back together and, and off he would go. Well, I really liked the operation, but I was still committed to the Ewell Bell and Olson car. Uh, Jack Ewell got out of the hospital. We started running that car again. And that's when my interest turned to having a car of my own. But I was looking around for a way to do something on my own where I could expand the reach, move maybe up to the next level or whatever. And uh, an opportunity presented itself when a, a good friend of mine uh, had a top fuel car that was for sale. Um, I thought it would be a, an excellent opportunity for me to go out on my own and the car would be complete less engine. And of course, I didn't have an engine, but never let a little thing like that stop you when you have a plan. You know? <laughs> uh, this car was called the Black Plague II, which was a replacement for the original Black Plague car in which John Martin, unfortunately, crashed to his death in Tulsa, Oklahoma that year. And that was a Gilmore chassis too, wasn't it? Another Gilmore chassis. And uh, the, the car was built to replace the one that had been loaned to John Martin and Tom McEwen, who ran the car back there in Tulsa. And uh, Frank Rupert and Steve Pick, who were the owners of both cars, when John Martin was killed, Steve Pick, who owned a machine shop up in Long Beach, just lost his passion for drag racing. It's, it, I could tell that it took a real toll on him. And uh, as a result, when the new car was ready, instead of putting it together and running it, they just put it up for sale. And I knew Frank Rupert really well. Good guy, great guy. And uh, we struck a deal. Uh, I was able to scrape up enough dollars to buy just the, the running chassis. Uh, no wheels or tires and, you know, just the, the basic stuff. But it was brand new, never been run. I called an old friend of mine that I had raced against quite a bit in Northern California uh, named Don Bowman. Don Bowman and I went way back, all the way to the very beginning. Uh, I think I met him the first time in 1965 at Fremont when he walked over to my pit area and asked if my name was Carl Olson. And I said, yes. And, and he said, uh, my name's Don Bowman. We're going to race in the first round. I'm going to whip your ass really bad. Uh, well, wow. This guy, this guy, uh, wow, what's his deal, you know? But anyway, we went up and raced, and I beat him. He didn't like that at all. And uh, as a result, uh, he would call me every week down in Monterey to, to find out where I was going to race that weekend, whether it was Fremont, Half Moon Bay, Sacramento, Salinas, whatever. And he would follow me there so that he could whip my ass. And he never did. Uh and what started out as kind of a semi-confrontational relationship turned into a really good long-term friendship. And uh, Don had moved on. The car he was running at the time was a blown small block Chevrolet on nitro. And he was blowing it up all the time. And I convinced him to build a Chrysler car. He, he was a Jim Davis chassis guy. Jim Davis owned a chassis shop up in Walnut Creek, and he was part of what I called the Walnut Creek Gang in Northern California. Uh, it was uh, Jim Davis, uh, uh, Mad Dog, Don Cook, uh, a bunch of kind of tough, rough and tough guys, and uh, they all ran Jim Davis chassis, and Bowman fit right in with them. He, you know, he was he was a bare knuckles kind of guy, and and so I. I got to know him and all of those guys pretty well. And when I acquired this Black Plague II car, I made a call to Don Bowman and told him what the deal was. He had just crashed his car 
uh, at Bakersfield, and he, he was hesitant to build a new one just yet. He was trying to get over the, the heartache of having crashed a car and destroyed it, and a brand new car I might add. <laughs> And I knew that he had an engine or two laying around. So I told him I got this car and, and maybe he'd be interested in putting an engine in it. We could run as partners. And he just thought that was a great idea. He said, absolutely. Let's do that. Uh, he said, drive your Ford pickup truck up here the next chance you get and, and make sure you got a trailer hitch on it. And I'll, I'll put some parts in, in my enclosed trailer and you can haul them back to Southern California. So I did, I drove up to his shop in Lodi and uh, I op he opened the door of the trailer and I looked in, I couldn't believe my eyes. He had like three complete top to bottom 354 Chrysler Hemis. He had three or four Enderly bug catcher uh, injectors. He had at least four really good like Bowers type superchargers, 671 superchargers, boxes and boxes with rods and pistons and rings and bearings. And I, uh, I thought, I, could, I couldn't believe it. I said, you're suggesting, I, he said, well, I haven't any use for it now. And if we're going to run this car, you're going to need all of this stuff sooner or later. So <laughs> let's hook it up. And so I did and um, dragged it back to Southern California. And I, I had the car repainted, uh, uh, Kenny Youngblood, of all people, painted that car in a in a garage off an alley in Long Beach, California, uh, in the dead of winter, using the homeowner's uh, clothes dryer propped open, blowing hot air in there so it was warm enough that it you know wouldn't freeze up and and hopefully the paint would dry sooner or later. I mean, this is the way it was back then, you know. And Kenny, I could recognized right off of the bat this guy was really special and we developed a wonderful friendship and relationship that has has existed right up until today and i'm sure beyond um got the car back uh, actually had a, a nose piece the car when i got it only had a shorty body i had tom and hannah build a nose piece for it beautiful car uh put together you know one of don bowman's 354 chryslers and went racing and uh Took it to Phoenix to the AHRA Winter Nationals, where I went four rounds in the 32 car show. Um, ran at uh, Stardust Raceway in Las Vegas. Uh, ran the Winter Nationals at Pomona. Went three rounds there. And finally, it was defeated by uh, Don Garlitz in the semifinal. But I beat, you know, Jerry Roof and Dwight Salisbury and Gary Cochran. And, you know, I mean, it was, uh, we were on a roll. And so, Bowman wanted me to bring the car up to Northern California to run it at Fremont because the only race he had actually attended was Pomona. Um, and it turned out to be a bittersweet weekend because I was racing, or I was qualifying against Pete Robinson when he crashed to his death. So it's kind of an odd weekend, but we really did well there. And, and so I decided to go ahead and take the car up to Fremont and run their Northern Nationals event. And uh, on my first qualifying run, it was a very blustery day, which is pretty typical at Fremont. Uh, wind blowing hard. And uh, I was making a run, got down close to the finish line, burned a piston or two, got a face full of oil, and I drifted off the left side of the track into the grass and was doing just fine. The parachute was out. I was slowing down. And I got to the first turnout road and when I went over that road, the car got airborne and got upside down. And the bottom line is the car was towed. I, I'm, I, matter of fact, I'm looking at a picture right now that must have been snapped. It looks like the car was still in motion because the parachute's out and you're upside down and backwards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, full gainer. <laughs> yeah, the good news is that I was totally unhurt because of the construction of the car. And I always, always, always had the very best safety equipment available, period. No, never any compromise, never. Um, but I towed the, the remains of the car back to Torrance to, to my house and shop and um, stripped it down, took the chassis over to Woody Gilmore the next chance I had. He looked the car over and he said, this car is unsalvageable. But... What I will do is I'll work with you on, on building a new car, you know, uh, start gathering some money. When I have some downtime at the shop, we'll 
we'll get started on the car or whatever. I said, okay, that sounds like a really good. After I had driven for Mike Cool the year before for that one weekend when we did relatively well, he had heard about the crash up in Fremont and called me and suggested that maybe it would make sense for me instead of going whole hog with trying to rebuild that car to drive his car until I had enough money to do it properly. And he would pay me a percentage of whatever earnings the car made. And, and it sounded like a really good deal. And I said, okay, let's do that. So the very next weekend, we towed the car out to Orange County Raceway. Um, it was uh, the final of the four round uh, OCI, our all pro series event that ran every winter when all the hot dogs were out in Southern California during the winter. And uh, we ran that against some of the hottest cars in the country and won the race. Uh, that was only one of the handful of top fuel races I had ever won. And it seemed extremely easy to me. It came a lot easier than I had expected. And I was really comfortable in the car. We towed the car back to the shop from that race. Uh, and this will now be er very early on a Sunday morning and the crew had all gone home and I sat down in the office in the shop with Mike Cool, and he said, hear me out on something. Instead of just driving this car for a, a while and putting your car back together, why don't you consider that maybe we run this car together for longer than just a few races? And my response is, why don't we just run together forever? Um, he kind of was a little taken aback by that, but he said, you're on, we shook hands. And that was the beginning of the Cool and Olsen partnership. Uh, we ran that car, the front engine, Woody Gilmore race car engineering car uh, at the NHRA Spring Nationals in Dallas, a bunch of local races. Uh, but uh, it was about at that time that Don Garlitz had showed up uh, in 1971 at Lions Drag Strip with his rear engine car that everybody laughed at. And I have to say, I, there was probably a chuckle or two coming out of me as well, because we were all familiar with people that had tried rear engine cars and it had always ended badly. Um, and we had heard the rumors that Garlitz and Connie Swingle, who built the car, were having problems of their own. It wouldn't go straight. He almost crashed a couple of times testing down in Florida. And so everybody was pretty nonchalant about him showing up with this thing. And of course, at Lions Drag Strip, he didn't win that night. Gary Cochran won that night, but Don Garlitz was runner up and probably should have won the race. And shortly thereafter, uh, took the car out to Pomona and won the Winter Nationals. And, and Cool and I decided right then and there, time to call Woody Gilmore and talk about a rear engine car. And we did, and uh, you know, Woody was absolutely committed to doing that. He had tried some things with some pretty unusual rear engine configurations, one of which Pat Foster crashed at Long Beach horribly. Uh, but by that time, the secret that, that Garlitz had been keeping about what calmed their car down and made it drivable, which was to slow down the steering, was common knowledge. And of course, Woody Gilmore proceeded on that course. And uh, we finished the car up, took it out to Lions Drag Strip, unloaded it. I was going to make a, about a half pass. And uh, it felt so good and it was going so straight that I just couldn't help myself. I ran it pretty much to the first timing light. Uh, and ran a tenth of a second quicker than we had ever run before. Wow. And Mike and I decided right there on the spot, man, we made the right decision here. You know, we, we're, we're on, uh, on the ground floor of this evolutionary cycle in drag racing. And that's a good point too, Carl. And for the younger people here in our audience that, that don't realize this, we're, this period of time that Carl's talking about is a true dividing line between front engine and rear engine technology. He's there. Cool and Olson got together right on the edge of that, right in the very beginning of that. Yeah. Right on the leading edge of it. Yeah. You bet. Um, and because Woody Gilmore was so anxious to, you know, 
quantify all the things that had to change in order for a rear engine car to really work properly and all of that. Uh, he built that car for us for the cost of the chrome molly tubing. Wow. He waived all of his labor costs. We worked really closely with him on the design and everything. And in fact, Woody Gilmore came out the night that we tested the car. Uh, we towed it right from his shop to Lyons. And uh, when I made that first run, you know, obviously I'm sitting ahead of the engine, so I have no idea what's going on back there. Well, there had been a little oil leak. It wasn't serious, but it was like a valve cover gasket or something. And there was some oil running down the back of one of the valve covers. And Woody Gilmore walked over and he, he wiped some oil off of the valve cover, walked over to me and stuck it in my eye. <laughs> what the hell was that all about? He says, you're a top fuel driver, right? I said, well, yeah. He said, that comes with the territory. And I went, not anymore. It doesn't. We all had a big laugh. Uh, I really didn't think it was all that funny when he stuck his finger in my eye, but I later came to appreciate uh, the humor in it. And uh, we, uh, you know, took that car to Orange County and, and ran it a, a race or two, just in an aluminum body. And then we took the car apart and uh, had George Cerny Jr. paint it. Matt Quick did the lettering. Phenomenal paint job. Yeah. Psychedelic, you know, for right in, in the, the scheme of things in, in those years. <clears throat> and um, had everything polished and anodized and whatever. Took the car to Indianapolis for the NHRA U.S. Nationals and were awarded best appearing car out of 800 and some entries, which if nothing else, gave us some pretty good exposure. We qualified really well there and went two rounds, but eventually were defeated. And still, we knew we were on the right track. Uh, we brought, brought the car back to Southern California and ran it locally uh, for the rest of, of that year, 1971. <clears throat> and towards the end of the year, uh, we got together with Ed Donovan at Donovan Engineering, who was designing his new Donovan 417 all aluminum cylinder block uh, based on the 392 early Chrysler design. Um, and at that time, Mike Cool had a, a really close working relationship with Ed Donovan, and he decided to make us one of his first three customers, although customer is kind of an odd terminology because we weren't throwing a lot of money around. Uh, we were just getting the benefit of, of his experimental stage. Uh, I think John Wiebe got the first 417. Uh, I think Herm Peterson may have got the second and we got 003. Um, so we were right on the cutting edge of that. And we took that car with that engine to Pomona for the NHRA Winter Nationals in 1972 and won the race. Uh, I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you here real quick, Carl. I, I, I actually know the chronology of this. John Wiebe got 001002. That first one went back to Donovan for historical reasons. Herm Peterson had 003. You guys had 004, but you guys ran yours before Herm Peterson ever ran his. Yes. John There's, Wiebe ran his first. So yep. you're right. Yeah, we would have had 004. Yep. Um, because 001 never saw a drag strip. Yeah. It was just a prototype. Um, that win not only boosted Ed Donovan's business for the 417, uh, but we also had a close working relationship with a guy named Bob Brooks at BRC Rods and Pistons. Um, he had previously worked for Mickey Thompson in the, the piston and connecting rod shop. And so he knew the te technicalities of, of building and machining rods and pistons, but he was really new in the business. And we ran all his stuff exclusively. And when we won the race, he took out a full page ad in Drag News and National Dragster. And that kind of kickstarted his business as well. So that really cemented our working relationships with those two businesses, Donovan Engineering and BRC. Um, we um, subsequently uh, took the car up to Bakersfield to the March meet, and we were runner-up to Tony Nancy. I'm sorry, uh, runner-up to Tom McEwen. Okay. Um, and uh, in a close race, I might add. So here we are, Winter Nationals champion, uh, Bakersfield March meet runner-up, 
running really well everywhere we went, winning a lot of local races at the same time. And we got together in the shop one night and, and I brought the subject up to Mike Cool. I said, you know, we may not ever get this kind of an opportunity again. He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, traditionally, the cars that do well in the early races in the year, Winter Nationals and Bakersfield in particular, uh, are sought after by track operators in the Midwest and back East because of the publicity that they have already received. And it becomes a drawing card, East Coast, West Coast, all of that kind of stuff. I said, if we ever thought about the possibility of going on tour and making our living drag racing, this might be the only chance we have. Well, we were both married. We both had children. We both had mortgages. He had his own business, engine building business. I was general manager at Transdapt. A great job with excellent benefits uh, and a wonderful boss that pretty much supported me in whatever I wanted to do, including taking weekends off to go racing and all. I mean, it was really a nice deal, but that you know, if you were ever a drag racer, you wanted to, to go race everybody you could at every track you ever heard of and, and win all the big races and all the big money and kiss the trophy girl and live happily ever after. And, <laughs> and, and Mike thought about it for a day or two. And the next time I went down to the shop to work on the car, he said, you know what? I think you're right. He said, if you'll quit your job, I'll close up the shop. If you'll get on the phone and see what kind of bookings we can get, if it makes economic sense, let's take one year and go on tour. And we'll both promise our wives that this won't be forever. We're not going to do this for the next decade or two. We're going to take a year and do this and get it out of our system. And I said, you're on. Let's, let's do that. And I went home and I told my wife. She wasn't real happy about it because our <laughs> daughter was, was only a few months old at that time. Uh, but she knew long before she ever married me that she was going to be marrying a drag racer. And, and I got to give her credit. You know, she never hassled me a, a bit about racing. And even though eventually I think racing in general, probably after 22 years of marriage, uh, caused the split that, that resulted in divorce, I have no regrets about that at all and I certainly can't ever accuse her of holding me back from anything I wanted to do in racing she was as supportive as she could possibly be and, and I will always admire that a, a, about her and so I had the uh, unpleasant task of informing my boss Willie Garner at Transdap that uh, I was going to give him two to four weeks notice whatever he absolutely needed to find somebody else to either move into that slot or hire and to take my place as general manager and I, I'm not going to lie about it he was not happy about it at all he had groomed me not only in the business but my involvement with, with the speed equipment manufacturers association SEMA of which he had been president and and I kind of was his right hand guy during the formative years of SEMA and he had arranged to put me on the SEMA technical committee that originated the SEMA specs program that eventually evolved into the SFI spec program. And so he'd done a lot of things to introduce me to a lot of people in the industry and elevate my, my visibility and all of that kind of stuff. And he paid me really well. I had no complaints about anything to do with Willie Garner or Transdap, but he was a racer himself. And I think he probably remembered back when he walked away from a few things maybe he couldn't or shouldn't have. And uh, eventually, once the dust settled, he hired uh, another guy uh, to come in and take my place. Uh, and from that moment on, uh, Mike Cool and I were professional drag racers for the next year. Uh, we took that car on tour and ran a bunch of uh, pretty much all of the NHRA national events and four IHRA national events that we had booked, been booked into uh, and did really well. We were runner up at the first one called the Longhorn Nationals at Dallas, Texas uh, to Tommy Ivo. Uh, the next one was in West Salem, Ohio and we went a couple of rounds there. Uh, the next one uh, was Rockingham, North Carolina something called the U.S. Open. We won that race. And during the eliminations, I actually beat Don Garlitz when he was at his prime, which uh, is something that I had always visualized possibly happening, but more than likely not. 
Um, and then we took the car to Dallas, Texas for the IHRA Nationals, which was the final of the four events of our commitment. Um, and we won that race, but it turned out to be a bad day um, that resulted in a crash that destroyed the car. And it kind of all gets crazy after that. Well, there's a, it, it, again, uh, I'm looking at a picture of, uh, I think that's Carrier standing behind you and Mike. You guys are sitting on a guardrail with your trophy laying down on its side after that race. Uh, you Did Carrier wanted you to bring that car up to have a picture taken of it, didn't he? Actually, it, it was a photographer, a photojournalist named John Asher. Okay. And I think he had suggested it to Carrier, and Carrier thought it was a good idea. So he came over to us and said, hey, you know, this is after we had collected what was left of the car at the end of the track, uh, and there wasn't much. And he just thought it'd make a spectacular photograph to have this <laughs> pile of junk in the winner's circle, and Mike Cool would have none of it. He was not proud of what had happened. You know, this, it turns out this wasn't our Donovan engine. We had hurt that at, at the U.S. Nationals in Indianapolis. And we were using spare cast iron 392 Chrysler Hemi engines. And this one was the last in our inventory. And it had some problems, some cracks in the main webs. And eventually the crankshaft fell out of it in the last round. And they, uh, it resulted in a pretty ugly crash and fire. Fortunately, we had ordered a new car from Woody Gilmore. Uh, weeks earlier, and we had the existing car sold and had taken a deposit on it that we, of course, then oh. had to give back. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was a crazy time. We only had two weeks before that event and the NHRA World Finals in Amarillo, Texas. And so we rushed back to California. I'll never forget. We uh, first stop we made was race car engineering, Woody Gilmer shop in Downey, to see if he had started on a new chassis. Um, this is only 24 hours after we called him on the phone and told him that we destroyed the car. Uh, we were really disappointed when we got there. It was lunchtime and, and Woody wasn't there, but there was nothing on the chassis jig, not one piece of chrome molly tubing. And we were really disheartened. Oh boy, you know, we we're committed to our sponsors to be at the world finals in Texas. So, uh, you know, wow, what are we going to do now? Uh, about that time, Woody got back from lunch and he said, oh, what are you guys doing here? So well, we came here to see how maybe some pipe was coming along. And he said, well, you're in the wrong place. The pipe's down at Tom Hanna's shop and he's already putting bad body panels on it as we speak. And we're like, oh, oh. Really? So got back in the truck with the mess still behind us in the trailer and stopped at Tom Hanna's shop. And he was in the process of forming a shorty body, a seat, fuel tank and whatever. Wow, golly, that's great. You know, so bottom line is Mike Cool got a new Donovan 417 block. I spent all of my time at race car engineering, working on pedals and linkages and doing fabrication work and whatever. He was building a new Donovan 417 engine uh, and, and then ordering and amassing spare parts and whatever. We went to Amarillo, ran there, didn't do all that well, uh, but the car showed promise. We then took it to Ontario to the NHRA Super Nationals, and we ran much better there. Uh, went a couple of rounds, I think. And then the last drag race of that year was, in fact, the last drag race at Lions. Uh, and uh, the drag racing gods just shine down on us that weekend. Uh, and after qualifying second, I think with a 6.09 elapsed time, um, you know, we marched through the rounds and uh, raced Jeb Allen in the final and beat him to win the last drag race at Lions. And because I had literally grown up at Lions Drag Strip, which was just a few miles from my home in San Pedro, and, and ultimately when I, I got out of the service, moved to Torrance, you know, it, it, if I wasn't doing something else, I was at Lions Drag Strip every night and I raced there every chance I could. And uh, to actually win that event was the absolute highlight of my drag racing career. I think other people might consider some of the other races that we won as, as being bigger and more important, but none were more important to Mike and I uh, 
it, it was definitely uh, an event to remember. Well, let, let's be, before you move on, let's let's actually talk a little bit about that because I I have this fascinating it, it, it to me Lions is quintessential Southern California drag racing, and I have a fascination with that track because it closed before I even under I was old enough to understand anything about it. That race, um, and I've heard this described by many people, but you, you, uh, Moody was actually supposed to be in the final round, wasn't he? Yes. And what's the reason? I know he was put out, the brake rule brought Jeb Allen up, but there actually was no brake to his car, was there? No. Uh, the brake was to their spirit. Yes. In order to understand how that all came about, you have to appreciate the fact that the place was a zoo. It was completely out of control. There were more spectators than had ever been there for any event, and a lot more. I mean, literally, people had just, when the sheriff locked the gates at 6 p.m., when he felt that it was at capacity, uh, people just laid over the chain link fences and swarmed in like ants. It was crazy. Uh, uh, we just kept looking up, going, where are all these people coming from? They were everywhere. They were all the way down the return road to the end of the racetrack. I mean, it was just absolutely crazy. And because it was the last event, it, it was really bittersweet for most people, ourselves included. You know, okay, it's going to be a great race, but this is it. We're not going to be able to come here and do this anymore. And, and you know, we loved being there and the relationships that we had developed with the track operators like C.J. Hart and Steve Evans and Mickey Thompson in the early years and whatever, just working their butts off to make it the best place to race, you know, flawless uh, immaculate track preparation and whatever there were you know back in those days traction compound was just becoming popular and most of the time you just ran on bare asphalt but <clears throat> people like cj hart would have it power washed every week to have the optimum traction capabilities for good times and whatever and so yeah, i mean it's just a wonderful place to race and the people that you got to know there you grew up with they were your childhood and and early adult friends closest friends you know so uh, it was a crazy night and and what happened was to the best of my knowledge and i've never spoken to moody about this but i did have a conversation with wes cerny about it it stemmed back to the fact that there was a five thousand dollar or three thousand some number of thousands of dollars bonus up for the first car to run a five second elapsed time at lions it had been done at Ontario, and it had been done supposedly by some other people at some more obscure tracks. But Lyons wanted, Steve Evans in particular, wanted Lyons to go out with the reputation of being one of the fastest drag strips ever. And without a five second run, that probably wasn't, it wasn't gonna be considered in those terms. So there was this cash bonus that was put up and evidently Cerny and Moody didn't even know about it as I found out later. Uh, but most of the fans knew about it and they all wanted to see a five second run just because that's what they wanted to see. And Moody qualified with a 602. You don't get a lot closer to a five second run than that. But an, a really interesting thing happened the next day on, on Saturday, December 2nd. We had classic Southern California Santa Ana conditions. Santa Ana condition is when the wind blows from the north or the east off of the desert and blows hot, dry air over Southern California. And the Lions was famous for its rare air. More often than not, uh, the, the fog would roll in off of the harbor, which is only a few miles away. And it, you know, it was heavy, cool, damp air that made for great horsepower. And, and that was a feature of Lions that everybody took advantage of. And you tuned for it. You, met, you had a different tune up for your afternoon qualifying run than you did in the semifinals or the finals later at night when the rare air came in. Well, there was no rare air on December 2nd. And so nobody ran a five second elapsed time. And certainly the car that was considered the best possibility of doing that was Cerny and Moody because they'd already run low ET of the meet. And, uh, and certainly the car under the right conditions was more than capable of running that. 
but it didn't. Nobody really, we didn't run up to our qualifying time in the 6.0s either. You know, everybody was in the, the 16s and 6.20s that night, including Cerny and Moody. And evidently, every time they came back down the return road after they won around, the party animals who were pretty much getting completely out of control with alcohol and uh, whatever else you know, might have been floating around, uh, green clouds. And things like that. Um, they they were pretty hard on Moody and Cerny, and and at one point after their semifinal round win, coming down the return road, some of the spectators or the, the animals or whatever were throwing beer cans and bottles at not necessarily the race car, but the push car pushing the car. And Wes Cerny said we're out of here. This is crazy. We're getting back. As soon as they got back to the pits, he told Don Moody, drop the trailer door. Let's shove this thing in and get the hell out of here. This, this is getting way out of control. And I don't want to be around for whatever's going to happen from here on out. Yeah. So we didn't know that. All we knew is we thought we were racing Cerny and Moody and it was going to be a tough race because they had run a little bit tick quicker than us pretty much every round up to that point. Um, Steve Evans came around and said, Moody is broke. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to insert Jeb Allen, who he, who Moody defeated in the semifinal on the break rule. So that's who you're running in the final. And I thought that's great because we were really close to the Allen family, uh, and, and Jeb in particular, uh, when we had toured in 72, we pretty much ran all the same places all the same time. And when we'd run an NHR national event, we'd pit next to each other. We ran a lot of match races against each other. We kind of booked ourselves as a match race duo. Um, they ran Gary, Indiana, US 30 drag strip every Friday night like we did at the Chicago style shows that, that uh, kept the money flowing for us and pretty much paid all of our expenses for the week before we went to a real drag race. Uh, and so we were really close with those guys. And like I had, Jeb Allen had grown up at Lions Drag Strip. I mean, literally from, you know, a babe in arms. Uh, so to be able to race against Jeb, win, lose, or draw was going to be a plus. But if you know any drag racers, you know that winning is what it's really all about. And so when we did... You know, it, it was an overwhelming feeling. Uh, and because the place was absolutely so crazy, and, and after the, I mean, even leading up to the final, it was out of control. But after the final, it was really out of control. I mean, there were fires burning and people unbolting guardrail sections and digging up chunks of asphalt with pickaxes and, <laughs> uh, and towing Larry Sutton up and down the track and for the potty. <laughs> <laughs> So we had made arrangements with the Allen family after the final round, regardless of who won, the crews would come down and we would stay down in the shutoff area at the end of the track until it looked safe to go back up to the starting line. We were down there for more than a half hour and uh, we kept having people drive down and say, not yet, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> And finally, uh, somebody came down and said, yeah, come on down. They're, they're going to start the winter circle stuff now. So we went down, got our picture taken and, and uh, whatever, and drank some cold duck. And uh, we didn't get out of there until probably about three o'clock on Sunday morning. And uh, I, I remember driving home. You know, obviously, we'd love to go to a bar and have a cocktail or two. But at three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday, that's probably not going to happen. So, I, you know, I just... Cool took the car back to the shop and, and I drove home and uh, had a couple of real stout Jack Daniels and sevens and uh, spent a, the next couple hours till the sun came up the next morning uh, thinking about what had just happened and, and being pretty much overwhelmed by it. And, and I'm still pretty much overwhelmed by it. You know, it's interesting you talk about your connection with that race and your interest in it for whatever reason, it's taken on a life of its own. It yes. really has. Yes, it has. Um, and I'm rem I was reminded of that a few years ago. I always went to the International Drag Racing Hall of Fame induction banquet in Gainesville, Florida every year, because every year, at least one of my friends was being inducted, and I, and I felt it was my obligation to go do that. And every year at that banquet, they had a cocktail hour 
before the actual sit down banquet. Uh, and they bring in all kinds of photographs and memorabilia and whatever in, in, a, in a separate room and everybody would chat and, and you know, get, have a couple of cocktails, get loosened up a little bit for the banquet. And I remember standing, talking to somebody and there was a group of photographers, the hardcore guys, the Steve Reyes's and the, you know, those kinds of guys, uh, four or five of them that were at every race that you went to and their pictures always showed up in Drag News and Dragster and Hot Rod and Car Craft and Drag Racing Magazine and all of that kind of stuff. And they were having a conversation and one of them asked the question, what one standalone event, standalone, not part of a series, not part of anything else, just a one-off event stands out in your mind as the most important and, and uh, notorious single one event, one-off drag race of all time. And they all agreed it was the last drag race at Lions Drag Strip. Now for guys that have been to hundreds, if not thousands of drag races, to hear them say that drove home to me that maybe I'm not the only guy that, that thought that was a really important event, you know? And to this day, uh, you know, I, I get a lot of great satisfaction out of the fact that we were fortunate enough that night to have all the pieces fall into place and win the last drag race at Lions. Mm -hmm.